Hi, and welcome to another installment of Espresso, Enlightened Espresso, uh, with Master Hang Chong. Um, if you'll notice, welcome. Um, if you'll notice, uh, as you begin to watch the different segments, they'll be anywhere between 12 and 16 minutes, but um, we didn't label them one, two, three, four, so they're not in sequential order. You can tune in to one. Um, it should stand and live on its own and uh, then tune in another at your leisure to, so you can watch uh, many or you can watch few. So um, with that, welcome Master. Thank you for being here. Yes. We wanted to talk today a little bit about um, a term which you and I have discussed a lot in the past and that's um, that, that life is suffering. Mm -hmm. And you had some specific teaching for me on that concept would you mind elaborating a little bit about suffering from the Buddhist perspective? Sure. The Sanskrit version or the Pali version of Dukkha, and we always translate it into um, English as suffering. That's the, the, uh, we call the standard translation in the Buddhist, uh, when I was first came to Buddhism, that's what I learned about. So even in Vietnamese, we think about the words as, as suffering, something very bad to experience. And uh, the, the Buddha um, had his own experience. He went out to the, the gate and he saw someone dying, someone sick, and um, somebody else was giving birth to the baby. And those kind of, he termed it dukkha, suffering. But nowadays, we can see that that term is, is have to be expanded because it's not only suffering, but something that we're dissatisfied, we're not happy with. And sometimes we call stress. Stress is something that we, we're unable to deal with. It's just coming in and, and, and we're just there. Stress. And sometimes, uh, many people nowadays, um, especially the young generation, they call dis-ease. Disease, dis-ease. And for me, as I grow as a Buddhist monk and grow up with the concept, I start to see that there, the, 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 the concept of suffering is, is, is expanding, 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 dukkha, that not only dissatisfaction, because from the point of view of how we see, you know, I, I feel that I was powerless to deal with sickness. I'm powerless to facing death. And I felt so vulnerable when I read or listen to some talk about my sickness, for example. I am in the news. Or the end of the, 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 the month, if I'm, uh, somebody come up and said to me, hey, Master, the bill of the, the, the electric bill is very high. Well, wow, it's a kind of stress, right? And so the concept is, is become expanding, and, and you start to understand that the one big thing about um, the suffering, the dukkha, is that we are powerless, and then it come in many directions. It doesn't come and tell you that, oh, I'm coming tomorrow. It's so interesting how it creeps into our life, how it gets into us that is very, in one way we say imperceptible, but the manifestation is palpable. So that's dukkha, that is suffering. But we, we talked, when we've talked in the past and, and you know, we try and relate Buddhist concepts to today's society, our culture, right. our Western culture, American culture. Right. Um, you, you, you described it to me as suffering being less accurate than the word dissatisfaction. Right. And I heard you mention that today. Talk about dissatisfaction and what we experience and how we would manage that from a Buddhist perspective. Okay, you have to get to the very key understanding and that is we always have expectation, we have desire, we have something we want, we have a picture that we believe that picture is unbroken. That's a perfect picture. We believe so much that, okay, if I grow up, then I will be in prime all the time. I, I don't expect it to get old. And if I'm young, I don't expect to get sick. If I play golf, I don't expect to lose. If I drive, I don't expect to have any accident. So that built-in expectation that we never really Examine, ask ourselves, what, what, is, what is the assumption there? What, what, what do we think about ourselves? So a lot of times that we're talking about that is ignorance. So ignorance is actually the biggest suffering that we all have. Mm -hmm. We don't realize it. And that's why when um, 
I remember the very simple story when um, I asked my own master, I said, Shribu, how do I experience the dukkha? And he said, didn't you get sick? That means yes. suffering. How would yes, we suffering. experience the dissatisfaction? Right, right. Okay. He said, so, didn't mean you get sick? He said, yes, but, but I, I still don't see how that would be the first principle, the first noble truth, the Buddha said. And he said, well, what can you do about it? I said, you know, I can't do anything about it. But the conversation is, is very short, but the master said to the very point that we just talked about, that you expect that you don't have sickness. That's why it becomes so painful. So the process is, isn't that the, the pain or the sickness, but the unexpected arrival of that. And then our deep, deep expectation based on our assumption that we are perfect. A friend, one of my friends, um, his son died. He struggled with that because he never thought that a son would leave him before his own departure. He felt painful, very painful, right? But the assumption that, okay, if you're younger, then you don't die before me. You gotta stay there, so I die earlier than you. That's assumption, and then we have so many assumptions we built in, in the, our culture, in, in many ways that we think and we speak, and everything that if you look into it, you see how this assumption is just completely beseech us. We, we don't see them. We don't know them. And that is the only way we can discover them is through meditation. And the very first principle of, of meditation is how we clear our mind and try to understand that very subtle movement of our mind, the movement that creates this assumption. Uh, we call it ignorance, but actually this is very deep the assumption that I am something, I am something. And therefore the way that um, to, to, to answer your question, it is it's very deep, deep ingrained, ingrained kind of attachment to a certain assumption that we have. And that is probably the very suffering thing. It's not the stress outside only, it's not the disease, but this whole deal, the mental construct that we have, believing that this construct is real. But let me let me push back on that a little bit and sure. give me give me your thoughts. So dissatisfaction created through expectation. There's certain expectations that that I have in my life of myself Good, and yeah. how I should act, and yes, the right. expectation of say mm -hmm. being a good father or a good right, husband right. or 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 getting good grades if you know when I'm younger, which mm -hmm. by the way didn't happen. But um, if I had those expectations, mm -hmm. and and you have expectations of yourself and your conduct and things like that, isn't that a healthy thing? It is healthy. It's a structure that we need to have. We need to have certain expectation. We do, we do have. For example, you know, you, you expect that at lunchtime, you expect to go and eat. <laughs> That's a very simple thing. But what happened, it doesn't go along with what you wish. It doesn't go along with your expectation. What do you do with it? And that is why uh, the, the whole thing about stress, about dissatisfaction is, is how do you respond to it? How do you see it and how do you really not only see that, the stress, but you see your own expectation, and you see the view about who you are. It's all come down to the one thing. Are you, live, are you living with all this erroneous expectation? Are you live with a very reasonable expectation? I, I, you know, for example, you live, and you expect you drive, you expect that you drive 55 miles, 60 miles an hour, no accident. You know, within the certain range expectation that is functional. We cannot have some expectation is um, unreasonable. Give me an example well, of an unreasonable expectation. Well, um, the unreasonable expectation, for example, for me, I'm simple monk. I expect to become a millionaire tomorrow. No way. Or even a millionaire tomorrow. <laughs> That's impossible. But we don't know that this range of limitation we have. And so we think that we become a very powerful person. We always think that we can change the world, but maybe we cannot change the person next to us. So this expectation, one, but 
I think more when we're talking about the dukkha or suffering, we're talking about the powerlessness to recognize the limitation of, of what we are, who we are, what we can do. Uh, I think it's that more reasonable as the Buddhist uh, and how do we approach this? And our process is to recognize our expectation, to recognize things that inevitable and things that we cannot change, things that limitation of our power and don't overstretch and, and think that we can fix everything. We, can change everything. From a, from a day-to-day -day perspective, give me, give us some practical applications. So real-world examples of how we begin to eliminate these expectations. And if I'm hearing you, begin to eliminate or, or reduce the dissatisfaction. We recognize, that's the first thing, the recognition of the, the stress the source of stress, the dissatisfaction. Just recognize it. That's the first thing. The second thing is you reflect upon yourself and start to see that it's coming from certain kind of desire, certain kind of wanting to have a picture perfect life and see how vulnerable we are just to recognize that. That's the second kind. And that always comes from a very deep meditation. The reason why you do meditation is because you, you start to see that without thinking. You be very intuitive and you recognize that, oh, that's, that's, that's my, my limitation there. And I, I cross the border, I'm, I'm going over, I try to get this. I got to you recognize your desire, your um, wanting, your wishing, your deep, 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 slowly, slowly appear as the veil of ignorance. So that's, that's the, the, the beauty of uh, the suffering is this. It helps us to wake up the sense of awareness. So we need to have suffering, we need to have stress, we need to have all of them so it work up in ourselves the sense of limitation, understanding of our own wish and our want, and get us push us to the point that only when we are in the deep, deep sense of quiet, serene, when we can look at things without any expectation, then we start to see all of the suffering and, and this as it's funny, all of come. It's just because we have so much wanting that the self, the ego, the sense here, always wanting to accomplish something, always want the picture perfect of life. Be very quiet, very calm. Come back in and stay very still. So you can start to see everything come to you. We go witnessing. We witness, we see things happening, not wishing, we not doing anything. So, so you're saying recognition would be the very first step? The recognition, the awareness of that suffering, yes. So in, in some sense, would even watching this video mean you're searching? Meaning right. when you're searching, do you, do you eventually recognize? Hopefully. The point is, is sometimes we see the suffering. But then we act upon it by trying to eliminate it, try to play God. Okay, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. But maybe that's not the Buddhist approach. Maybe that could be effective in other in, in certain area. For example, I see the disease, right? And nobody else discover how to deal with that. So now I learn uh, medicine and I try to find a cure. You know, that's very positive for sure. Because you can fix, you can fix something that is fixable. Um, but there are a lot of things that you cannot fix, and most of the things you cannot fix, it's not very far away. It's about, you know, your desire, your wanting, your wishing to get the uh, picture perfect of your life. But yeah, the the those striving for that perfection, right? You're saying we want to do that within limitations or boundaries of what's achievable. It's achievable depend on how you look at the object and you look at the cell and you see is this really a product what you do is a product of your selfish desire or, or your pursuit is actually bring benefit to others bring benefit to you so it's really striking a balance between what you do inside and what you do outside so this is a very a dance of middle way and that's why when we learn about dukkha, about suffering, 
we also need to learn about the limitation of our self, how we recognize the powerlessness and not try to be powerful, and how in certain things that we need to be very powerful and not play powerlessness. So it's you have opened up the can of worm here with many other things that could it's, be happening. It's, it's a dance, and and so much of so much of what you talk about ends with the stillness with the serenity that you find in meditation. Deep that's awareness. a good, that's a good, once you're recognized, yes, start right. to mm -hmm. be still and understand. Right, right. So that's a deep awareness. That deep awareness is really release you from being stuck in the suffering because you may think it's a suffering, but actually it, maybe it's not the suffering. Maybe it's something else. And that's, that something else is your own desire. And you, you've talked to me in the past about desire stemming from ego, and um, uh, we're coming to an end. So if you want to tune into a, another installment, uh, we'll be discussing ego and, and what that means from a Buddhist perspective and how we may experience it here in, in the West. So uh, thank you, Master. Appreciate it as always. Well.